Video games aren't cool anymore. And at least, they're not trying to be, anyway. I'm generalizing, of course, but today, most AAA and third-party games are trying to do too much. Trying to be too much. Weighed down by predatory design aimed at developing games, not as an art or a medium, but as a service players are meant to continuously consume. Others chase down needless validation from outside sectors, and the allure of achieving prestige by disregarding the medium for something more cinematic. They are games afraid to be games, where the design philosophy of gameplay and narrative feels disjointed and over-exuberant, where interactivity is secondary. They've forgotten what they are. In many ways, game design peaked long ago, back when the world soaked itself in the bubbles and cords of cyber aesthetics, and the evolution of hardware felt like tangible exponential growth. We were on the precipice of a vast new digital frontier, facing the turn of a century, and the possibilities of what we could achieve through technology seemed limitless. It was what we did with what relatively little we had that truly left an impact. Since the early 2000s, video games have continued to grow tremendously. In fact, they're now the leading medium in entertainment. As of 2022, the global video game market size was estimated at a whopping $217 billion USD. For comparison, the global movies and entertainment market as of 2021 was valued at $90 billion. For music, only $34.5 billion. And yet, despite their success, many games failed to revolutionize in significant ways beyond graphical fidelity chasing the ever-elusive threshold of realism through increasing polygon count and refined shadows, often failing to even resonate. So, as game budgets continue to balloon toward unsustainable sizes, and experiences are diluted into whatever can be successfully commercialized, it's the games that are backward-looking that begin to set themselves apart, what others figured out a long time ago. It's the core gameplay that matters, more than anything else. Nowhere is this philosophy better embodied than with Sony's PlayStation 2, a console with key developers laser-focused on maximizing interactivity as the primary language for engaging storytelling. Pioneers with vision, setting foundations in game development for console generations to come. Where every aspect of a game, down to its minute details, informs us of its identity. Even the best of modern video games take lessons from these titles and directors. So while many of today's blockbusters rely on tired formulas and filler content, the best games strip everything down to only what's absolutely necessary, just as they did 20 years ago. In this regard, today's best games aren't actually a modern needle in a digital haystack of tired monoculture. They are a product of our evergreen past. Echoes of our wonder years, revolutionized to get the most out of systems, and mechanics before anything else. They are PlayStation 2 games. PlayStation 2, <laughs> the best entertainment system to hit the, to hit the world. It's going to be great. The PlayStation 2 released in the U.S. on October 26, 2000. It has since become the single best-selling console with 155 million units sold across its unprecedented 13-year lifespan. In the U.K., Pro Evolution Soccer 2014 became the last game to release on the console a mere week before the launch of the PS4 on November 15th. Yeah, Sony continued to make and sell PS2s through the entirety of the PlayStation 3 lifecycle. 
it's easy to understate just how important the PS2 was for the video game industry. From the beginning, Sony bet big on forming a confident identity around the PlayStation 2, staking a claim that this console was not only one of a kind against its competition, but that there was no competition. Why should there be? The PlayStation 2 was a manifestation of the future, a monolithic machine of the ultra-modern, with the puddle of astral blue soaking up into the walls of a midnight black mainframe. Even the logo, with its angular design, resembles the framework of computer information highways, as if data and lines of code traveled along its hard gradient blue edges. Aesthetics needed to reflect the ethos of the console. They were equally as pivotal in the console's it factor Sony seek to market. Against its competitors, the PlayStation 2 quickly positioned itself as the oddity to be curious about. And Sony's print ads for the new PlayStation doubled down on its misfit identity. From the Cronenberg-esque renderings of misshapen humans, the lascivious controller symbols displayed as undergarments, to the undressing and dicing of flesh and skin, and the provocative imagery of sensuality. The PlayStation 2 was a place more free than the naked body itself. Commercial campaigns from filmmaker David Lynch accentuated the tone the console was going for, likening the experience of playing the PS2 with dream logic. Lynch even caps the TV ad with a talking duck, Welcome welcoming players to the, to the third, third place. place. One otherwise inaccessible without the console. Even the Bambi commercial, directed by Kevin Thomas, presents its thesis with text. Different place, different rules. But it wasn't just the peculiar PlayStation seek to identify itself as. Futurity was also on the mind. After all, Y2K only comes around once. While the glossy sheen of a reflective model against a smooth white backdrop evokes the feeling of staring at a forthcoming space age, commercials like the fictitious PS9 further doubled down on that notion of futurity, of entering the digital realm through hardware only accessible through Sony. The future was here, and the future was a PlayStation. And if you were living in contemporary society, you were just as much a target audience as anybody else. In an article from gamesindustry.biz, former president and CEO of Sony Computer Entertainment America, Jack Tretton, said that Sony targeted the console for an audience of primarily 17-year-olds. We had the exact audience in mind for PlayStation 2 that we did for PlayStation because it was so well targeted. If it isn't broke, don't fix it. We used the age of 17 as kind of the target of the bullseye, with the theory that everybody under 17 aspires to be 17 because of an older sibling or you're going to have your driver's license. If you're older, you hearken back on your teenage years. This attitude of nonconformity and individualism through teenage angst was at the heart of everything PlayStation 2. And in turn, this deviant and futuristic aesthetic had to be reflected in the games themselves. After all, how do you follow up the legacy to a console that was, by your own making, more powerful than God? The key was in the production of hardware with directorial vision at the center. The PlayStation 2 was notoriously difficult to develop for. Despite all of Sony's marketing around the central processing unit of the console, dubbed the Emotion Engine. Stacks of manuals written by Japanese engineers plagued developers. With the learning curve so steep, it took multiple read-throughs to even begin to understand the process of routing commands simultaneously through the multiple processors of the PlayStation 2. All of this was, of course, intentional. In an article on the difficulty of developing for the PS2, Matthew Bird of Den of Geek says, Finally, and this is really important to keep in mind, the PS2 design may have been complicated, frustrating, and perhaps a little scummy, but the PS2 was still an incredibly powerful console that was capable of producing effects that even the more powerful Xbox and GameCube couldn't match. This hands-off approach Sony took to game development is, of course, a controversial one. One they've stopped pursuing after the PS3 and the divisive cell processor. 
The Venn diagram of Sony and arrogance is more than just a little overlapping. However, despite the risk factor of a gamble of this size, it was one that paid off. Sony wanted developers who would take the time to develop specifically with the PS2 framework in mind. With vision and a level of auteur that began all the way back in pre-production. With every step of design along the way, ensuring a product was made with gameplay totality in mind. On YouTube, The Gaming Brit Show has a video specifically on the atmosphere in Tekken 4. It's a wonderful video that analyzes the elements that make up this entry in the Tekken series. Everything from its menus and soundtracks to the presentation of the fighters' narratives. Every aspect of game design in Tekken 4 is in dialogue with one another. Collectively forming the futurism aesthetic many developers followed when developing for the PlayStation 2. Tekken 4 was not unlike many of its software family. Res embraced the digital frontier and its effect on the way we'd confront digital space with its powerful tagline, Go to Synesthesia. Of course, a game about confronting artificial intelligence through a vast futuristic global network also utilizes an interface full of digital prompts. As if we ourselves were behind the screen of a windowed command shell, feeding prompts into a user interface. And games like Armored Core Silent Line and Devil May Cry triumphed in their relative simplicity. They were games built on the basis of a straightforward presentation, with a clear aesthetic and on the premise of a level-based gameplay loop. So then, based on all these amorphous notions, what is a PS2 game? Definitions are, of course, nebulous, but for the purposes of this video, we can distill it down to a single core idea. It is stripped down game design, with an emphasis or priority on core gameplay mechanics and a clear aesthetic that in turn inform all other aspects of storytelling. They are video games not afraid to be a video game, requiring the player to meet it on its virtual terms. By these definitions then, it's important to note that a game does not have to be exclusive to the PlayStation 2 to actually be a quote-unquote PS2 game, merely that the philosophy stemmed from major PlayStation 2 games, later informing others on other consoles or on future hardware. So when we call the game a PS2 game, we don't mean the graphical simplicity or, when compared to contemporary standards, awkward controls. But it's a distinct feeling when faced with a project stamped with confident identity. It's a vibe you can't shake, an ethereal notion you can't quite pin. It's a design philosophy. The priority of systems and mechanics is vital to this discussion. I can't help but think about Kojima and his PS2 title, Metal Gear Solid 2. For his tactical espionage action sequel, Kojima and his team at Konami pushed the hardware to impressive technical heights. For MGS2, systems and mechanics weren't just the priority in game development, they were the selling point. With a reveal trailer at E3 2000, showcasing the interplay of shadows revealing Snake's position, dynamic lighting affecting shadow play, complex stealth mechanics and enemy responsiveness, and object interactivity. In their Gaming Bolt technical retrospective, Arjun Krishna Lal says that Metal Gear Solid 2's greatest technical accomplishment wasn't in terms of on-screen realism. Rather, it was the fact that this remarkably detailed game ran at a nylocked 60 FPS average. Metal Gear Solid 3 ran at a jankier 30 FPS to accommodate larger outdoor maps. But the smooth 60 FPS update in Metal Gear Solid 2, combined with the stellar visuals, make it clear that Kojima and Co. knew what they were doing with PS2 hardware. To put this into perspective, there were only a handful of 60 FPS titles on PS3 a generation later. Many, like Call of Duty 4, featured sub-native rendering resolutions, poor texture quality, and primitive lighting. It's a minor miracle Metal Gear Solid 2 was not only one of the best looking games on the platform, it was among the best performing. Likewise, John Linman of Digital Foundry in his Metal Gear article published on Eurogamer says that 
Kojima envisioned huge numbers of enemies on screen with bodies that remain in the scene. The interaction of light and shadow, physics interactions with real world objects, multi-tiered environments, and advanced enemy AI. The intent was not to push visuals to the limit, but rather to use the processing power of PlayStation 2 to deliver an enhanced gameplay experience. The emphasis on gameplay as the primary means of engagement is what marks MGS2 as one of the Rosetta Stones for our definitions of a PS2 game. Not to mention the aesthetic building done through visual reinforcement. Menus with digital schematics and chemical compounds float behind windows of a user interface. And even further, the interactive documentary, the document of MGS2, leaned harder into the Y2K aesthetic with its drum and bass score and cyber frenetic intro. Honestly, we could spend even longer analyzing the elements that established Metal Gear Solid 2 as one of our defining titles for a PS2 game. But for now, our key takeaway is the priority of interactivity at the forefront of experience, one that was planned from its pre-production inception. In this regard, Metal Gear Solid 2 isn't just a defining PlayStation 2 game, it's one of the marquee design ethos trailblazers. Fumito Ueda of Team Eco similarly established his development philosophy dubbed Design by Subtraction, and it's probably the defining ethos for what we mean when we call a game a PS2 game. Both Eco and Shadow of the Colossus, despite their critical acclaim, were not necessarily blockbusters of their time. They simply aren't going toe-to-toe -to -toe against the likes of Grand Theft Auto or the Jack and Daxter series. But what these games do possess is a clear authorial vision. They are games elevated to the status of art piece through a passionate director's desire to connect players to a story primarily through the interplay of mechanics. In these games, story happens through action, and is sometimes subverted by a subsequent reaction, never leaving the interactivity happening beyond the controller level. And this philosophy is one of the reasons why a game like Shadow of the Colossus is so beloved today. That despite a subtle presentation, a game can still achieve emotional complexity through interactivity. And that rings true today with Team Eco's latest, The Last Guardian. However, for a more comprehensive analysis on Ueda's design philosophy, I highly recommend checking out two videos from the YouTube channel, Game Maker's Toolkit, Eco and Design by Subtraction, and the Last Guardian, and The Language of Games. These are both equally insightful videos that demonstrate a step further what simple game design looks like in action and how it compares to some more modern titles. I'll link both of these down in the description. Calling a game a PS2 game shouldn't be a derogatory claim. In fact, in many instances, these proclamations are implicit of an era that was interested in developing with clear artistic vision with as little barriers as possible to confront an aesthetic experience. Interface, soundtracks, systems, mechanics, all these things were at developers' forefront of game design, and every element of a game's philosophy went toward crafting an identity. Philosophies like Ueda's design by subtraction weren't anomalies, but an artistic byproduct of existing technological limitations of hardware. The aim wasn't always for fidelity and the cinematic, but how singular experiences can be made to tell stories in interesting ways through established gameplay rules. Luckily, this philosophy isn't lost today. It's just harder to find in that monotonous sea of monoculture. And yet, there are a handful of titles that stand out as the direct result of so-called retro game design. Games with confident aesthetics, games with an emphasis on the mechanics happening as a result of the controller at your hand. Modern games with PS2 philosophy. We're close to Rubicon. Wake the dog up. It's hard to think of a more quintessential title that adopts PlayStation 2 design philosophy and brings it to modernity than with From Software's Armored Core 6 Fires of Rubicon. Directed by Masaru Yamamura, 
AC6 isn't just backward looking in its approach to design, it's a game pulled from a franchise that had its last major installment over 10 years ago. And in a world where the likes of Elden Ring shook expectations from From Software fans and pushed our presupposed notions of what open world exploration in games could be, creating a sequel for a series we all thought was a relic of the past was a surprise, much less unprecedented in our current industry. In a Forbes article titled, Staying True to the Legacy of Armored Core, Yamamura and producer Yasunori Ogura detailed their approach to AC6's design, highlighting key influence from titles earlier in the series and a priority in AC systems and mechanics. Our titles in recent years have been focused more on role-playing game action and exploration elements, Yamamura says, but Armored Core 6 is very much a mech action combat game. When we say that, we mean it focuses on two core concepts, that being the assembly aspect and the intuitive mecha action concept. We feel that these two core concepts are the staple of the Armored Core series, and we wanted to bring that back in Armored Core 6. Of course, a level-based game isn't new or novel, but it highlights a stark difference between games that follow older philosophies and those that adhere to the likes of stakeholders. There is no unnecessary bloat in AC6. Seriously, there are no barriers to interactivity. In fact, the aesthetic that holds up the presentation of AC6's menus reinforces that engagement, even beyond assembly. Choosing one of the available levels begins a presentation, with an on-screen briefing on display as if we ourselves were in our mecha cockpit. Monetary mission rewards are based on mission performance, taking account ammunition spent and damage taken as overhead expenses we must bear. Even the language of sortie to begin a mission further immerses us into the eyes of our pilots and the world of Armored Corps. And when we're not away on a contract mission, we sit patiently in the hangar, either training in virtual reality simulations, finding recorded AC data from main characters in the arena, or tinkering with our AC in the garage. In Armored Corps, the gameplay doesn't stop when we aren't in combat. The menus are just as much a part of it. It's Armored Core 6's simplicity that makes it stand out against its peers in 2023. Even despite the complexity of how individual parts affect your AC, the overall gameplay loop of experimentation through various builds is reminiscent of Ueda's design by subtraction. Stripped down, Armored Core 6's loop consists of three major facets. Buy a part and try it out on your next mission. If it doesn't work out, swap the part at the next checkpoint for something else. And repeat, meaningful mechanical actions at the hands of the player, constantly. This is only reinforced in subsequent playthroughs of the campaign, where previous missions on New Game Plus now feature twists that affect the ending based on your decision and subsequent action. Every part of the game's design challenges who we are as the pilot Raven through our engagement with these systems and mechanics. How we prepare for a fight, what we spend our money on, what decisions we make, and what the fate of Rubicon is. It all starts and ends with gameplay and the philosophies of the past. The augmented human in Armored Core 6 is more of a narrative construct than a game construct. The old generation augmented human in our game is supposed to invoke this mute, motionless pilot who is built specifically to pilot these impossible machines of destruction. It's kind of tapping into that cold, indirect portrayal of this mercenary, and we wanted the player to enliven that role. So the augmented human aspect in Armored Core 6 is purely part of this game's narrative setting. It's important to note that stripped down game design doesn't necessarily mean a developer isn't taking advantage of technical specs on modern hardware. What's important is how it's being used to reinforce gameplay and establish its aesthetics in order to function as what is arguably another modern PS2 game. This past year, Remedy Games' Alan Wake 2 bathed in the glow of Pacific Northwest neo-noir, pushing the boundaries of the medium of what we consider a game. Yet, Alan Wake's two story is one that could only be told through interactivity, with Saga Anderson's 
in Alan Wake's mode of storytelling, unearthed through their gameplay mechanics of the Mind Place and the Writer's Room, respectively. While the use of modern technology allows us to access the Mind Place or the Dark Place instantaneously, it's the commitment to the gameplay loop of the case board and the draft board as the primary means to progress through the game's story elements that is core to our established definitions of PS2. As players, we're asked to meet Alan Wake 2 on its virtual terms, to place ourselves in the role of the detective by methodically placing evidence on a connected board, to progress through ever-winding story elements through draft permutations, and in the pursuit of achieving something truly postmodern, what we consider gameplay is challenged, with overlapping visuals of different medium superimposed onto our screen. Whether that be characters, a TV commercial, a musical performance, or even a short film. One that can be found on the likes of real-world websites like Letterboxd, with official credits given to fictional characters. The game doesn't end beyond the edges of the screen. This aesthetic reinforcement is what makes Alan Wake 2 not just an artifact worthy of analysis, but a bona fide interactive video game through and through. One that fits into our framing of a PS2 game, with mechanics as storytelling devices as the driving philosophy. And there's so many examples found beyond the likes of AAA. 2022's indie darling Signalis uses inventory management and static shooting to reinforce its survival horror genre, but more importantly, emphasizes its storytelling through recursive gameplay, wherein restarting the game after supposed endings lead to different conclusions. So too is this true of Platinum Games' Nier Automata, where POV shifts and various modes of gameplay interactivity not only change on subsequent playthroughs, but are fundamental in their means of storytelling. And of course, Tango Gameworks' Hi-Fi Rush stripped everything to craft a game built around one mechanic, action and interactivity through music and rhythm. They are all, in their own specific ways, projects with these stripped and focused philosophies, comparable with PS2 design practice. Not every game we think might fit this mold succeeds in this endeavor. Most recently, Capcom's remake of Resident Evil 4, despite its critical praise, veers away from its original mechanics in order to find a more modern footing. While the original revolutionized third-person shooting mechanics in the industry, the deliberate choice to make Leon static as he readies his gun to shoot stood as a mechanical reinforcement of RE4's survival horror. The choice players have to make between either moving or shooting was one that added to tension the gameplay built itself around. Similarly, the degree of control players have while escorting Ashley, while perhaps not a popular one, further reinforces this tension. In an attempt to modernize, both these elements are gone in the remake. Leon can move while he shoots, and the degree of escorting Ashley is minimized where encounters can be cleared with passive attention to her safety. And while I don't argue these changes, nor the game, are necessarily bad, they do make for a different experience. There's something lost in translation. It no longer feels like a game made among the greats of the PS2 generation. Even games with strong and focused mechanics can fail this design philosophy aptitude by introducing unnecessary elements. Games like Ghost Runner 2, despite its strength in action mechanics, are bogged down by gameplay bloat such as hub areas and open environment levels, bringing the fast-paced action found in the original to a needless halt. Critics had similar remarks for Angel Matrix's Neon White, where the hyper-engaging gameplay loop of FPS platforming to improve against friends and level leaderboards was continuously interrupted with storytelling devices and hubs that felt disjointed with the core mechanics of the game. These sorts of additions happen regularly, and they often feel antithetical to what a game should be, an experience told through focused interactivity. Modern philosophies of squeezing audience retention, or worse, money, out of players is fundamentally contradictory to what makes these modern PS2 games so special. And, as examples of PS2 games grow few and far between, with studio closures and rampant development costs, 
I fear modern philosophies of game design will have dire consequences for the industry. Most recently, a cyberware attack on PlayStation-owned studio, Insomniac Games, revealed the precarious nature of modern AAA development. It is not sustainable, and publishers are worried. Among the stolen data, some of which included highly sensitive personal information from employees, which was maliciously used as leverage to receive a ransom from Sony, were documents from internal presentations regarding sales figures and financials at Insomniac. According to reports, the numbered sequel to Marvel's Spider-Man, and what is now supposedly the fastest selling title in PlayStation history, failed to break even in the month after its release. One internal presentation pegged the final cost at around $300 million, almost three times the cost of 2018's Spider-Man for the PS4. Despite selling over 6 million copies as of November 12th, Spider-Man 2 will need to sell 7.2 million units to earn back the development cost. For comparison, other first party titles like The Last of Us Part II, Horizon Forbidden West, and God of War Ragnarok similarly cost hundreds of dollars to make, with budgets for all three titles costing just over $200 million. And in the wake of skyrocketing development costs, Sony is seeking to further offset strained finances by forcing additional rounds of layoffs and a possible studio closure. It seems as if the games industry bubble, under current practices, nears its forthcoming burst with every new major release. So, what do we do when the best-selling games in a series find it increasingly difficult for publishers to sustain and, despite success, are still victims of downsizing? The answer, once again, lies in the past. Developing games within a franchise is obviously difficult. Studios have to both create a game that exceeds fan expectations under tight deadlines while avoiding crunch and keeping costs as low as possible. The rallying response from audiences is thus simple. That we want shorter games with worse graphics made by people who are paid more to work less and we're not kidding. The spirit of this message may be difficult to put into practice among AAA games especially when the barrier to entry is the high cost of hardware amid a looming economic recession, or in the promise of current generational hardware is the output of 4K high fidelity graphics with smooth, stable, high frame rates. Developers are put in a precarious position the minute we swipe our credit cards to purchase whatever box we choose to place in our entertainment centers. And yet, look no further than Rockstar's previous practice of how they treated sequels to an entry in their best-selling series. Sequels that went on to sell more units despite reusing previous assets from the earlier title. I'm talking, of course, about Grand Theft Auto 3. After the commercial success of Grand Theft Auto 3 in 2000, Rockstar followed up their success with two separate sequels, both within the span of two years of each other. GTA Vice City in 2002, and GTA San Andreas in 2004, each of which sold more units than the last. And despite different stories with different characters on different maps, Rockstar was able to turn around complete games in record time. In comparison, GTA 6's release is still over a year away, despite the release of GTA 5 now over a decade ago. In order to streamline development, Rockstar reused the same engine and key assets, while still improving and tweaking mechanics in order to complete the sequels. We think of this practice as common, especially when we reflect on output from the PS2 generation. And to a degree, it still exists today. But development timelines of games at this caliber feel unheard of in our current generation. This streamlined spirit of the PS2, however, is one that Insomniac seems to have found themselves rediscovering most notably with their spin-off title, Spider-Man Miles Morales. According to Kotaku, despite its $90 million budget, Miles Morales would sell over 10 million copies at its modestly priced retail of $50 USD. Not only was the title both acclaimed by critics and general audiences, 
it was clearly a financial success for Insomniac. And while it was a one-off game, the title truly felt unprecedented in the current landscape of excruciatingly long development timelines wrought with crunch and rampant layoffs. Publishers now have the responsibility of creating and encouraging sustainable business practices for the game studios pitch and create. While Jack X Combat Racing may not have necessarily moved the needle, the practice of making interesting experiences through IP experimentation and reused assets, the likes of which we saw among PS2 games, should be a practice we preach today. It's a miracle that God of War Ragnarok Valhalla was released as a free addition to the base game, given how much narrative implications and replayability the roguelike mode has. Perhaps, in another world, the current trend of developing additional modes to include in previously released games can be both narratively and physically expounded upon as bigger, mid-budget titles. But more importantly, we need smaller, focused, quirky, unique games that don't cost a huge amount of money to make, the likes of which the PlayStation 2, and even leading into the PlayStation 3, built their identity around. Not a day goes by where I don't mourn the loss of the former visionary teams at now closed Japan's studio. Where would Sony be without the likes of Shadow of the Colossus, Ape Escape, and Bloodborne, which apparently sold over 7 million units, by the way? And the list of their impact is really hard to understate. While they may not have developed every game now engraved in their graveyard of credits, their influence in helping create and publish many titles is absolutely vital to the success PlayStation has had. It's easy to see why many developers leave their teams when studio closures, like Japan Studio, and internal project focus shift away from what's absolutely necessary in the development of a game. Recently, Hideki Kamiya, developer and founding member of Platinum Games, left his company in a surprise announcement. Director of games like Bayonetta and Wonderful 101, and especially prolific titles such as Okami, Beautiful Joe, and Devil May Cry, Kamiya is one of the industry's finest. Each of his directed titles, despite their availability on multiple platforms or their exclusivity on Nintendo hardware, embody the spirit of our PS2 game framework of core gameplay, confident aesthetics, and primary engagement through the interactivity of systems and mechanics to tell a story. Yet his leave from Platinum isn't surprising, it's indicative of where the industry is currently focused. Content. In an interview with IGN, Kami responds to this industry focus, one that invaded even the likes of Platinum, saying, I don't think of games as products, but rather as works of art. I want to put my artistry into games and deliver games that could only be made by Hideki Kamiya, so that players can enjoy Hideki Kamiya games exactly as they are. I decided to leave the company and forge my own path, to continue making games that reflect the developers who made them. It's a simple philosophical approach that Kamiya seeks, one that isn't really around anymore. We must not forget that Kojima was forced out of Konami and had to build a new studio in order to continue creating games. However, focused titles from auteur directors are not yet completely extinct. The bubble has not burst yet. And even more hopeful, these seemingly radical games not only still sell, but they even have the potential to be Game of the Year nominees. Designed by subtraction from the heyday of the PlayStation 2, still lives on in the spirit of many modern titles. And if we want to see more games like them, then it's our responsibility to continue championing them every chance we get. And the sooner we get back to the sensibilities of our past to create better, more engaging experiences, games with stories told through interactivity, through simple design and clear aesthetics, a game that could only be a game, the more ubiquitous games like these will become. Because it's not just the grandiose cinematic titles that supposedly hold up the industry. No, it's the little guy, the one with the old ways of thinking, that makes the landscape so diverse and drives us to new, interesting heights. These are the games that matter. These are the important ones that can change the industry. These are our modern PS2 games. <laughs>